I have with me uh, Michaela Estrada and uh, Mark uh, Kamasarov. And they are into something that I think is one of the most important subjects in the world. I've done a number of interviews on um, this whole idea of teaching people to see with, uh, without using their eyes. And I have said numerous times that if it were a fair world, this would be Nobel Prize stuff. But it's not a fair world, so people are just going to ignore it. But we have to do the interviews, and eventually people will catch on. Um, I'm, I'm, my interest in this is, is extremely into the what is going on, what does this mean for reality. Um, so welcome, Mark and Michaela. And I want to uh, get you to introduce your, your, your company that you've sort of started, uh, um, in, InfoVision, and explain to me uh, maybe how you got into this and what you think is important about all this. start because you are the first in the company. Uh, the history of InfoVision started in 1999, a little bit more than 20 years. And you know a couple of words about myself. I was born in the Soviet Union in Moscow, lived there for years, had engineering degree, and in 1989, uh, I with a family immigrated to, to the United States. Uh, and as I said before, in 1999, accidentally, I met one person who said that he can see using, without using his eyes. I didn't believe in miracle, but I, very, everything is so interesting for me in this world. And when somebody said that he can do it, I want to see it. Yeah. And if I check it and see it works, for me, it stopped to be a miracle, it's become reality. So I had agreement with this gentleman who said he can see without using eyes. I came to his apartment, he showed me his blindfold, I checked it. It was no holes, nothing. He put it on a uh, face. I check about gaps, everything was clear honestly. And after this, he started to demonstrate me his ability. He followed me in his apartment without any problem with the furniture, no touching them. Uh, I opened the book in front of him in any page and he could read. He comments me what happened on the screen of his TV. So everything was honest, clear for me. So from this moment, I understand that that is real ability, not miracle, not fraud, it's a reality. And when I understand that that is a reality, I thought, uh, do we people need it or not necessary? And I understand a little, little bit later, maybe I say you my way to understanding that we need it. The question is, I strongly believe that we human beings uh, are the same creatures. We have two hands, two legs, brain. So my strongly believe in that if somebody can do it, all others can do it. So this unusual ability we have, everybody of us. But we need to find the way how activate this ability. And that was my goal. Uh, I create methodology that I believe could activate this ability to any person and then try it, try it with the kids successfully. I understand that it works and uh, people can use it. Uh, you know, it's very important for me, uh, my student or other people ask me, Mark, but can it be dangerous for our mind because you are come inside? I said, no. I like to uh, compare something. And I said, you know, uh, this ability I call center direct of information perception. And everybody has this center, but it cannot uh, turn on 
by itself. Accidentally, like with that man, because that man can understand nothing that happens with him. That is all. So I compare it with center of speech. Everybody has center of speech, but if this center will not activate it, we never start to talk. And we parents, from the first day of our kids are born, we activate this center. We are talking with them, talking, talking, talking. Approximately from one year, we're not just only talking, talking to, to them something, but ask the question and make pause, push our kid answer this question. Kids start to say something, break the board, say, uh, say some sounds. We fix it and can correct it and continue to do. We activate this center of speech. And in two, three years, all kids start to talk. So the same I decided. I need to create exercise that push our brain to activate this center. And uh, the key, let's say, it, key decision, we make masks on uh, our eyes of our student and push them to receive visual information without using eyes. Before, uh, when I start working with new class, I show that that is possible. I demonstrate kids or adults who has disability, it was activated. So they know, the brain knows for sure that it's possible. And when I put the mask and say, try to see this, try to do that, they know that it's possible. They see it a couple minutes ago that it's working with other. So brain, again, third time I say, brain, brain knows for sure that that is possible. And it start to try to find the way how it uh, start to receive visual information without using regular sense of feeling, without using, using eyes. And my methodology, now I can say it, it's not my methodology, it's our methodology. Because about six years ago, uh, I met Michaela, she was my student and she liked InfraVision so much. She became for the beginning uh, the teacher, trainer for activate disability to other person. And then she goes with me for many seminars and she create new branch of InfraVision. After this, I said that you are not my student or teacher, you are my co-author, because right now InfoVision has two branch, one direct knowing, that is my part, and another direct vision, that is part of Michaela. And uh, it's, InfoVision has so many benefits, not just only possibility to see without using eyes. Uh, for example, when the student activate this ability, and if they have glasses, they don't need it. In uh, visual, uh, visual, visual image come to the brain directly without using eyes. So all the problem of the eyes disappear. Other thought that came to me years ago, if uh, brain can receive visual image without using eyes, blind can see. And we work with the blind and they see, and not just only people who lost the, uh, the possibility to see, but blinds from the burst. It's a special methodology, but it works. If uh, our brain can receive, and it can receive not just only visual images, any kind of images. If uh, our brain can receive uh, sound, voice images without uh, using years directly. So the problem of deaf people disappeared. So it's, I can say about this long, long, long and many interesting, interesting, inter interesting, but I want uh, Michaela to say about her branch, how she find and uh, fall in love in InfoVision and what she produced as a InfoVision co-author. Yeah. But for me, it was uh, oh, yes. Uh, for me, it was interesting from the very beginning the impact of the method. Not so much the ability in itself, 
uh, of course, it's impressive to, to realize that such a thing is possible. And it makes you wonder what other things you can do and you have no idea that you can do. Uh, however, due to the impact on my own uh, health system and mind system and emotional system, uh, I got more interested into this uh, side of infovision. Um, and I thought uh, at the time, Mark knew that infovision can, could at the time, help with five issues. Uh, visual problems, no matter how severe they are. Hearing problems, same. Uh, IQ. Uh, dyslexia, so generally speaking, learning disabilities. And uh, speech problems, if they are not morphological in nature. So the first question that came to me was, how can you get help with five seemingly totally separate you know deficiencies and most likely areas of the brain operating that uh, possibility of the brain uh, with the same st uh, set of exercises with a standard set of exercises you can help with these five issues um, and then when i saw things changing in me uh, that got me really interested, uh, thinking that, you know, we have five issues on the list that uh, initially to me uh, didn't make sense. Why would you get it smarter if you see colored papers? Okay, I accept Mark's explanation that maybe more of the brain is used or better or whatever it is. Okay, fine, I get it. You see better, okay, you open up a channel, an alternative vision, okay, fine, makes sense that too. But why would you hear better if you train this ability to see without the eyes? That didn't click to me, it didn't make any sense. And then when I saw the changes in me, that those really didn't make any sense to me. So I thought there must be something else uh that that is happening that we need to explore and use it maybe we are using very little of the potential of the method itself so accompanying mark in his seminars i started sharing with people uh this is what happened with me after the seminar pay attention to yourself see if you are getting something not just the actual ability but anything else and then people started to share with me oh it seems like i sleep better i'm not so nervous anymore uh my mood is better i don't wake up moody anymore or this or that or i don't eat that much or all sorts of little things that uh, somehow confirmed my uh, initial thought that maybe provision can help with many more things than those five that uh, I knew at the time. So my next question to myself was, okay, now we know it's not only those five. Uh, how long this list can be? Like, what else can we put on that list that we can check, test, try, and uh, confirm or not that information can help with? And I started offering uh, my help to, to people saying that this is uh, just a theoretical understanding that I have but in my head it's totally clear it should work 100% but you know everybody needs proof myself including so I told people this is just experimental if you are willing to try something completely unorthodox let's do it so I tried uh, it with Parkinson, I tried it with Alzheimer, then with ADHD with children, and this is not just trying this methodology now. Uh, autism, um, brain, cerebral palsy, and uh, all sorts of other things, a combination of things, or uh, the, the 
downside of Down syndrome, for example, because Down syndrome in itself is not a problem. It's the impact of that the, the, that creates underdevelopment in a child that is the problem. Um, so that, that, that was my interest and that's the branch that Mark mentioned that I'm using the blindfolded vision to somehow give a push to the system for reset. So that whatever the individual problem or problems may be, they get help with that individual particular problem. And this is where I find Intervision absolutely beautiful because uh, if you pay attention to the information, direct knowing what Mark is teaching, so you get access to solutions for that particular person in that particular moment, then you can really help the, the person with any health condition or emotional condition. We also had one case only, but that was enough for, for trying to see that it works of dementia and it worked even with that lady uh, so it, it has the potential to work with everything um, i am thinking uh, i really believe that we ourselves have yet to discover uh, the full potential of infravision i think we are at less than half of its potential, what it can do. Uh, and we still need to understand a lot of things, a lot of details to not only to improve continuously, which we are doing, but there's room for even more improvement. Uh, but also uh, my wish at least is that we make it faster because we are living in a, you know, against the clock era. And uh, people, many people don't have the, the commitment, the resources, I would say, not the commitment, the resources to commit themselves for five years of therapy, right? Everybody wants it fast. That's how we are fed with information, little processing, fast absorbing and moving on. Uh, so we are, uh, trying to uh, go deeper but also wider so that we can address as many issues as possible as fast as possible of course uh, admitting that it's not a hundred percent guarantee that it works with anybody uh, because yes to some point it is the brain but the brain is only doing what the mind is wanting to achieve and there's definitely the soul involved there and there's absolutely the divine involved there. So it's not like we are, you know, we just push a button and the miracle happens. When everything is synchronized, whatever that everything means, then yes, the miracle happens. When not, then we need to work. And there are also, we've had cases when it just didn't work. We understood why, but it just didn't work. So it's not uh, something mechanical. You just take a hammer and you bend the, you know, the, the needle and there you have it in whatever shape you, you have it. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of, it requires paradigm shift. It doesn't work otherwise. It's not a set of exercises you do mechanically and okay, eventually in a number of months you get it. No. You make the shift, then the training reveals the benefits. Um, in, in all the people that I've watched, there seems to be a, a difference between teaching children and adults. Can you describe uh, what, what the sort of the scientific basis of that is and um, how much difference there is in terms of um, how long it takes to do a child and how long for, say, an older adult. And where do you cut it off? I think you use the age 13 as a cutoff. Mm -hmm. Mark, you start with, uh, yes. Yeah, yes. and then I will uh, add the scientific part. 
You know, I was, when I, Infovision just only started, and I saw that it works, I find the difference between adults and kids. You know, for today, I'm saying about today, to activate this ability for kids, we need 10 minutes. 10 minutes, kid start to see being blindfolded. Okay, when I started, it was not 10 minutes, but maybe one hour, maybe two hours, but two hours more than enough for activation for the kid. With adults, I try everything. It did not work. So I try to understand. So for today, and everything that I'm going to say to you, I am chemical engineer. I have no, uh, I, I don't have degree as a medicine person, specialist in the brain, but I cannot do something if I don't create for myself logical explanation. So my explanation, when we come to this world, uh, we know nothing and we see nothing and we hear nothing. It's come to us through our sense of feeling, we receive the information and start to work with this. We have, uh, let's call it uh, space for receiving and remember uh, visual images, uh, hearing images, smelling images that give us possibility to recognize. But again, uh, I return to um, what for we need our sense of feeling. They need to um, protect us about any kind of problem uh, in, in the world where we came as a kids. But how can we know what is good for us, what is bad for us? It's my imagination, it's my theory that we, all of us, has in our brain some, uh, I don't know how to call it, ability, let's call it, that analyze information that come us from the outside, outside world. And this ability is here in our brain. And when we receive some information, it's analyzed. Is it good for us or bad for us? Is it dangerous for us? It's not dangerous for us. But when we come to this world, how can we know what is good, what is bad, what is dangerous, what's not dangerous? Somebody is supposed to teach us. I like, I said, I like uh, some comparing and I'm saying to my students, for example, it's a wolf family and baby wolf was born. And uh, parents teach him that is dangerous and you're supposed to run away that is not dangerous you're supposed to attack it that is possible to it that is not possible it that is that is, that is, that is but if this wolf baby will analyze is it true that it's dangerous for me or not true is it true that i can eat it or no if it will be yes no yes no without knowledge this education will continue through all his life and he die without understand nothing. So my hypothesis was good. For the beginning of education, this function disappeared, not completely, just turned off. And all information that baby wolf received from his parents, brain accepted without analysis. And he followed their mother, father, and they show him that is, you're supposed to attack, that it run away, that is eating, that is not eating. He received this uh, understanding this knowledge, let's call it. And when the baby become adult and go out of them, their parents, and he need to live uh, independently and make decision about what is wrong, was it wrong, what is correct, by himself. And in this moment, this function start to work. And now uh, the baby, or not so baby, uh, receive this information, he analyzes it, is it uh, bad for me or good? Uh, possible, not possible. But now he has knowledge, he knows what is good, what is not good. So uh, the next question was for me, when this function turned on? 
when baby stop to be baby, when he uh, become ready to create kids, he's supposed to care about them. So this function need him when he become adult. And uh, during my working with the kids, I pay my attention that uh, they start to accept my education. As an adult, approximately 12, 13 years old. Why? Because from this age, then can create the babies. Our girl can become a mother in 13 years old. Our boys can become a father in 13 years old. So uh, from this barrier, let's call it, or border, kids become adult and it will be absolutely different way of education. I have a methodology how, to, how I'm teach kids before 13 and how I'm teaching adults, for me adults from 13 and up to 100 years old. So that is my question, uh, my, I'm sorry, that is my answer for your question. Mikhail, can you add anything? Yeah, scientifically speaking, things are also very, uh, very clear, uh, but at the same time more flexible, interesting enough. And uh, this is why we can teach adults as well. Uh, what we call education or what Mark calls education up to those 12, 13 years old, uh, I call uh, programming. So depending on the, the information that we had been programmed as children, that makes the difference uh, as adults of how good and fast and open students we can be for absolutely anything. Uh, if you had a bad experience in your childhood about riding up the bike, for example, then uh, if you want to learn it again as an adult, that trauma will affect you and it will create problems. So I'm talking about riding a bike. Uh, if we are talking about improvision and other similar things, then things are even more clear that the childhood and the information that we've accumulated as children is um, defining um, our uh, openness as adults to unusual things. Um, the, 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 scientifically speaking, the difference between children and adults uh, is the brainwave pattern. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, it is very easy to get children which are generally in the theta brainwave regime into alpha, which is the higher one, and which is the uh, regime where the brain can absorb uh, larger amounts of information and process that information much faster, which is the actual explanation of why uh, children after doing the improvision seminar get smarter. Um, but it's not so easy to get adults which are generally um, operating in the beta uh, brainwave pattern down to alpha and let alone into gamma where the real superhuman, supernatural happens. Alpha is just uh, you know, a, a bridge to the actual potential that we have. Um, so Beta means thinking, and the higher the beta, the more compulsive the thinking is. And you need to get that brain down to at least alpha. And that is what makes it difficult with adults. Uh, uh, that's uh, why adults need commitment, because you've been in beta for 20, 30 years, it would be nice, you know, just do this and oh, boom, I'm in Teta. <laughs> uh, we are thinking of actually how to do that. And if that happens during the seminar, but um, 
it's not stable for the rest of the life, for the rest of our life. It would be a constant self-observing work to catch yourself when you are going back to the old habit of being in beta, uh, which is stress, energy depleting, judgmental, duality, criticizing, self-criticizing, blame, self-blame, and all of those uh, personality traits which we are very familiar with. Um, so that, that is, scientifically speaking, that's why it's so difficult with adults, first of all, to activate it, and secondly, to maintain it. It really requires years of not only mechanical training, but rather observing the mind, uh, observing how the mind sabotages us with the content that had been imprinted on us in the childhood, clear it and uh, eventually get into a state where um, you detach yourself from uh, whatever is not supporting you as information from childhood. Um, but even with children, again, uh, if they live in an abusive household, then they're not in theta as it should be at their age, they are more into beta. And they get the same difficulties because they come to you, they feel you, your relaxation and your self-confidence and, uh, you know, that you have experience. So they relax in your presence and then you do with them what you're supposed to be doing and then they get what they're supposed to be getting, but then they go home where there's yelling and fighting and criticism and then that child is at great risk of losing what they achieved with us. And it's a, it's a complex thing, which is why we started uh, involving parents as well. Because again, it's not a mechanical thing like I'm bringing to you my kid, fix him. No, it's a family issue. That child has problems not because of himself, it's because of the environment. And I'm saying that without pointing fingers, we all have issues, we all have difficulties, we all have challenges, and maybe we don't know how to solve them. And the children are very sensitive, and they feel that even if the parents are wise enough to try to hide their adult issues, the child feels those things energetically and absorbs them and it disturbs him. So it's a complex thing. Um, sometimes when, when um, discussion is made of these sort of extraordinary abilities, there's a, a discussion of right brain, left brain. Have you looked into that and have you done MRI type stuff with, that shows which part of the brains are, are being activated when this, this is going on? Definitely the, the, the first that we need to do, especially with adults, is cut off the left. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, it's nice to have intellectual discussions about infravision, but having an intellectual discussion doesn't activate the ability and doesn't develop it. Every now and then it may help, like an aha moment, but every now and then. If we just write a book about the theoretical understanding about infravision and people would read it, it would not help them much, uh, which is why we're not writing it. Um, second is definitely uh, pushing things to the right brain, uh, which means relaxation, being in the flow, um, holistic, uh, child-like attitude, like don't, I'm not criticizing myself if I'm not getting it, which we all do as adults. Uh, don't compare myself with the other peers, which we all do as adults, and so, so on and so forth. So the right brain is the child brain. 
very relaxing joy, not bothering about the failure for the child is not a failure, it's for the adult a failure. Um, but it is my understanding uh, from reading quite a lot about the brain. Again, myself, I'm not a, a medical doctor, I'm an English teacher, but I like to read a lot and I need to understand, I cannot do things mechanically. So I did my own homework, to a limit, of course, to as much as I considered necessary. And it is my uh, theoretical understanding that the process of learning infravision and possibly any paranormal ability, for that matter, is like this. Shut down the left brain, activate and train and expand the right brain because that is still something familiar or at least we remember from ourselves when we were children or from our children if we have them so it's not rocket science when we tell people you know relax if you get it you get it if not no problem things like that uh, so people slowly slowly relax and then they indeed get it and then they indeed get happy as children so we are going to there but it is my understanding that stable infovision and stable any paranormal uh, is not uh, the right brain. Uh, it is uh, what is called midbrain, which is a small uh, brain structure. Uh, it has uh, some components in it. Uh, the, the medical science does not agree on um, its structure 100%. Some doctors are saying this little structure belongs actually to right brain rather than to midbrain and so on. But generally speaking, uh, it, it has a definite uh, structure um, which has a unique uh, characteristic and that is, it connects directly to, if not all, then at least almost all of the brain. And when you have that brain structure operating, uh, not fully, nobody is there, the, the evolution stage that humankind is at, doesn't allow yet that this structure is fully uh, operating. Uh, that would mean all of the strands, DNA strands operating and so on. Uh, we are not there yet and we will not be for quite some time yet. Um, but anyway, you get stable with the ability, uh, the so-called paranormal ability, when this structure is stable enough, when it's trained enough, um, so that you can, first of all, immediately, if not, the aim would be you are constantly in that state where this ability works naturally, rather than uh, as in the seminar, you need to close your eyes, try to get it, uh, then check it. Uh, the more you do it, then the more often you get it, but you still don't get it, and then you don't know why you didn't get it, and so on. Whereas if you make it stable, and you, again, observe yourself, and identify, as I call it, as a motto for the seminar, what did you do right that you got it right? What did you do wrong that you got it wrong? That's more important than getting, right, getting it right itself. If you do it without knowing how you do it, uh, then you don't know when you get it right that you got it right, and you don't know uh, how to replicate the process to dismiss what you received and do it again, the question-answer uh, process, so that you do get it right. Um, but, um, that's how I would say that the left brain is the analytical brain, which 
generally actually really it's the judgmental brain not so much the analytical but the judgmental brain uh, and the process happening there of course simplistically speaking it's not so clear-cut but would be an uh, analytical then the right brain would be meditation being in the flow grading dreaming uh, and, and so on and the midbrain uh, i would say it's contemplation where you launch a question and you receive an answer it's not you creating the, the answer sometimes it's not even you creating the question itself somebody higher intelligence knows that you need this information so it implants in you the question and it seems to you that oh i got that question but it wasn't you who created it and then you also receive the answer because you needed that piece of information for a bigger picture that you are working on when when i first saw this um i've done a lot of work on contact modalities and uh out-of-body experience, near-death experience, UFO contacts and stuff. When I first saw it, I immediately um, tied it into people who will report uh, near-death experience in an operating room where the eyes are taped shut so the cornea doesn't get scratched and stuff. And as soon as I saw it, I said, oh, that's how they're seeing because the consciousness leaves. Is that a correct uh, a analogy in terms of what's going on here, that it is the same thing, the same type of vision and hearing that takes place during a near-death experience or not a body experience? Uh, yes and no. Very interesting. Uh, you know, there are, we don't know how many types of vision we are able of, to have. Uh, we, we have the, this solid vision, physical vision, uh, it's called, where you get to see the, the, the matter, the material things. Uh, and this is the one that Mark replicated through his methodology because his initial wish was that if we can see without eyes, then blind can see. And he wanted blind to see just like you and me. Uh, however, once that is activated and trained, the other types of vision somehow get activated by themselves because there's not again a clear cut between the types of vision it's the mind the conditioning that believes this is all that is you know the matter or if i am open to you know there's more than this then accidentally i can get to see without any training just activating the same this part of the brain i can get to see for example in my case orbs or entities seldom because somehow i'm not attracted to this but it happens uh aura energy i can see these things without any training just because i read about it i felt that yes this is true this is possible so i googled a little bit to see how to do it i played with it it worked immediately so that's another thing then literally you can see inverted commas in any way your mind is ready to accept and you know when you see the aura it looks like you're using your eyes right you're not putting any mask on your eyes to see the aura is it still the eyes that see the aura i don't know maybe yes maybe no maybe it's never the eyes actually that see maybe it's the illusion an illusion that we are seeing with our eyes maybe it's never the eyes maybe it's always that other channel which then according to our conditioning gets to work in this particular way or that particular way there are famous people around the world who were blind medically speaking meaning that they could not see the, the matter the 3d but they could see the energy so were they blind that they could not see the metal or am i blind that i cannot see the energy um, with near-death experience i have not had a near-death experience myself so i could not necessarily make a parallel 
but what I uh, can say is that you do get the psychedelic effect when you wear the mask. So you do get to see all those colors playing around, pulsating, coming, going, all sorts of uh, merging of colors, brighter or dimmer, moving around. So that you get. Uh, it's not the aim of the workshop. But as I said, we are playing with this because we know that people are ready for more now. It's time to, to expand the perceptions and give the, the people the possibility to uh, add to the perceptions, not only replicating this vision that works brilliant for blind, but for us, uh, it's really, really... Um, mind-blowing and shifting the paradigm when you get to see something that you really know uh, you, you never had it uh, or you forgot about it but uh, you know when you see orbs flying around that is such an exhilarating feeling really it puts you into that child uh, feeling that you are so happy and excited and there's no ego there and that's, I think, one of the other benefits of these things, that ego cannot coexist with child, our inner child. So the more these things are directed through education, through explanations, through exercises, through everything, more to the inner child, the less our ego is present and I think that's the ultimate benefit and uh, that's the ultimate goal that should be aimed at with uh, teaching and learning these abilities. Yeah. Microphone Mark. I want to add a little bit interesting stuff from our experience with InfoVision. First, when the people, skeptic people, that say it's impossible because it's impossible forever. Ask, not ask, they say. It's impossible to see if your eyes are closed. With closed eyes, it's impossible to receive visual images. And I'm answering to them like that one. Okay, when we are sleeping, our eyes are closed, but we see dreams, we see visual images. So we see it not through the eyes, through the brain. So InfoVision gives possibility directly received visual images in our brain. And they said nothing. Second, very interesting moment. Uh, I made my seminar in one city in Russia. And my organizer come to me and say, Mark, there is a woman, mother, uh, come with a girl. She is uh, blind from birth. Can you help her? She asked me. I said, okay, let they come. Door open and I see the woman and the girl, six or seven years old. She is standing and say, looking and say, oh, what a nice big room. Oh, I see on your table colored cups blind from the birth. I said, can you see it? She said, yes. I said, come to me, uh, pick up all red cups, keep up, pick up all blue cups. She did it. Her mother was staying here and I lost possibility to talk. I just said, how it's possible? She said, you know, when we recognized that our girl was born blind, we decided not to talk to her, not to do everything like she's blind. We all time, we give her something, not touching, and say, for example, that is blue color, that is yellow color, that is uh, your um, toy, uh, Barbie or something. The, we talk to her as a girl who can see. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's a geniusity, really geniusity. Because they do that, I did, but I know that it's possible. They push the girl not to use touching, smelling. They push her to see, and brain find the possibility to see. This girl see 
everything. She followed me in the class. She picked up all the color paints. She did everything. And that is my dream. I won't, I don't know how, uh, how in the internet or maybe in a stadium. Let's all families who has kids that was born blind, I want to say them. You know, if you want your kid start to see, you need nothing. You don't need medical doctors. You don't need my seminars. Just, just do everything that that woman did with her girl. And blindness can completely to disappear from our earth. So that is, I want to add, it's InfoVision, it's amazing stuff. Mark, I heard you tell a story one time about um, the girl who was reading off the computer floppy drive, uh, the files. What kind of paranormal, is it, is there, are people seeing stuff outside of time and space and stuff like that? Or I, sometimes I hear these kids who say, I can hear things a mile away. So what kind of uh, abilities do you think people actually have? Is it, is it unlimited? You know, first of all, it was not girl. It was adult woman, 40 something years old. Uh, you know, when we activate center of direct information perception, this, our brain start to receive any kind of information. And it does not depend from the distance and from the physical object to this. Uh, for example, one of my students being in Moscow, and I was then uh, time in New York, I cre uh, create my New York students come to the table. I call to that uh, woman, night, uh, light, light, uh, young woman, approximately 23, 25 years old. Turn on my telephone on a speaker model and uh, say to that woman, his name is Marina. Marina, right now my student opened the newspaper on my table in New York. Please, can you read the name of the article? And she read it. I cannot say that easy. She read it letter by letter, but correctly. Hair of my students goes up 6,000 kilometers between Moscow and New York, and she did it. And that about uh, reading uh, information from electronic source. It was 2001 year my uh, student and then become my partner in new york it's become very interesting for us if our brain can receive any kind of information can it receive the information from the electronic source it's information let's try uh, we made couple experiments and the finally uh, I took the floppy disk at that time, it was just only floppy disk, I believe you remember the small one. No flash, nothing, floppy disk. I put there some uh, information, gave it to her and said, Olga, her name was Olga, read it. She closed his eyes, keep his clothes approximately 10-15 minutes, say, then said, Mark, you put in this uh, floppy disk five files, brain one, brain two, uh, miracle from Willington, Nikola Tesla, Tselkovsky. Which article do you want me to read? Okay, read me Nikola Tesla. 10 extra minutes and she start to read like she keep the text in front of her. I ask her, Olga, can you see it? She said, no, it just come to my mind and I just verbalize it. She could describe, uh, I put the picture, she could describe who is staying on this picture. It's amazing opportunity and uh, that is InfoVision, InfoCenter. Uh, I don't want to say that it's come to you immediately, no. That uh, Olga, uh, she fall in life in InfoVision completely. And she was uh, come to all my classes and have a seat as a student with a new one and train, train, train disability. And I feel benefit from this one. First of all, she was training. And secondly, uh, the student, new one, see, aha, it's possible. It's make them extra point to believe. So uh, during my seminar, 
I teach my students to receive information from the past. And it was sent again. But for me, result only then is result when I can to check it. If my student during the seminar says, oh, I'll go to 2000 years in the past and I see how it's gladiator, Sparta, kill some. For me, it's not answer. How are you working with my student? I say, take out of the table, put some stuff on the table, keep it 30 seconds, catch it, hide, and say, okay, guys, turn back, see the table is empty, so close your eyes that nothing will be bothering you, and go to the past, not for the 2,000 years, not for the year, one minute, and say me what was here in front of me, in front of you. And they say, here it was a red color paper, uh, there was a cup, yellow color, and here it was your uh, shoes. <laughs> I take this stuff, put it on the table, exactly. I know that they can see the past. Uh, and it doesn't matter for me, one minute, one year, uh, 100 years, I know that our brain has this possibility. They ask me about future. Uh, I don't have... Uh, correct, direct answer, in my mind, but I'm logical, that uh, future, it's impossible to say future because it depends from, from the situation. For example, I say, I like some maybe crazy example. I come to the lady who can see the future 100%, no mistake. And uh, I ask you, please, uh, let, that is my hand. Say me my future. She said, oh, 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 your uh, line of the life so long, you will be uh, live 120 years happy, healthy. I'll take the gun and hit myself. And what she's supposed to do with your 120 years old? No. So I don't believe that it's possible to receive the information for, from the future, but I believe that future depends from the present. And if you have all information what happened right now, present, you can say with maybe 99% possibility what it uh, happened in the future. And again, I am sorry for this example. If you will, you can cut it. For example, I said to my student, I feed somebody here. And they can say in 10 minutes, <laughs> it will be Senyak Fist, Misha, how it's Senyak? Bruce. Bruce, yes. And you see, I saw the future, but I know what happened right now. So it's in for vision. I fall in love in this, and uh, it's extremely interesting, and everybody needs it. It is. I, I mentioned to you when you started, I have an assistant who has uh, almost total hearing loss. Can you tell me some of the experiences you've had with uh, people with uh, hearing problems and, and what success you've had? Uh, yes. Uh, my English is not perfect. So, Mikhail is a professional English teacher. So, I asked her to describe this situation in Italy when we had problem with the uh, deaf person. My, my assistant is actually a teacher as well out of Toronto. She teaches uh, uh, other children who have hearing problems and just, you know, uh, autism and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so, with both hearing and uh, vision, the, the initial discussion is whether the person uh, lost the perception some time uh, in their life, or they were born like that. Uh, if they lost it, then with work it's quite easy, let's say, to get it back. Why? Because the memory uh, has the information of how it is to hear, or how it is to see, if we talk about vision. So, Generally, you only activate the memory and then you refresh it and you make it stable and so on and so forth. If 
uh, those people never had that uh, perception, whether it's vision or hearing, then it's uh, a totally different methodology uh, and much more complicated because uh, we would have to replicate, literally, to replicate the learning process of that particular perception as an infant, which is practically impossible because simply the baby is a baby, no information yet, uh, the brain working in delta and in low theta, so absorbing everything, questioning nothing, whereas the adult, uh, it's uh, better where you, you challenge everything, you, need, you want to understand, so it's from that perspective, uh, it's quite difficult. However, with uh, people who lost their uh, hearing, for example, uh, the example that Mark wanted me to mention was a lady in Italy, but she's a little bit in between examples. She could hear with one ear, but the other ear was born totally not working somehow, some medical condition, so it was absolutely not working from the very beginning. However, she did have the, the other ear. Uh, so what Mark uh, did was once the blindfold activation uh, happened, then uh, he uh, started um, activating and training her hearing by, again, the same principle needs to be uh, in place every time. Uh, the lady could hear something with one ear, so that ear was plugged with uh, uh, wax plugs, plugged so that she cannot hear anything with the, not healthy really, but working uh, ear, so that only the other one was exposed to sound. Uh, that is one thing. And second, she was supposed to repeat what Mark's organizer was saying, but the lady, the organizer, was standing behind her so that she cannot read the lips, which is something people with hearing loss are very good at. So uh, Mark cut all possibilities for that lady, uh, the, uh, the old possibilities of her acquiring information, so that the only one that she could have available was the provision ability. And she was absolutely excellent. But again, she was not from death, from birth. She was not deaf from birth. We did have uh, experience with death from birth with children this time in a charitable project that I mentioned to you uh, in uh, Ukraine with uh, children who are going to a special uh, school for uh, hearing impaired uh, children and they were uh, born like that and again we did the blindfold and then we did the same we were sitting at the back and we were creating all sorts of noises sounds and they were supposed to locate where that sound was produced in that part of the room or in that part of the room or uh, which sound we were using two objects and hitting them and the sound was really different one was more like bass the other one was high pitched so they were supposed to identify which is which and the last thing that we uh, had the time to do was uh, mark would uh, hit um, big uh, cube and they were supposed to count how many times Mark was hitting that cube and for 95% of the time they were answering correctly even though sometimes Mark went all the way to 10 hits. So very very high accuracy. We worked 10 days with these children, one hour every day um, but again they were children again much more flexible with children interestingly enough the problem is the parents they need to step out of the memory of their children not being able to hear and so on um, 
but again, uh, I think with commitment and dedication, uh, it should not matter how long it takes if we want to achieve it and we do everything that it's necessary to achieve it. Beautiful. So, yeah. Yeah. Um so some of the videos I've seen, I've seen a lot of videos from a lot of trainers. Uh, you had the most impressive couple that I've seen. The one on, uh, I was looking for a long time with the kids playing ping pong. I was just amazed by yeah. that. And then, and then it turned out, I kept saying, is that your kid? And they go, that's not my kid. And then I discovered it was you. And the other one that I was very impressed with, you have a video that will link with the autistic uh, blind child. Can you describe that case and how that came to be? Yes, yeah, that was a really, really nice case. So. Just very briefly, the ping pong uh, um, is very, very difficult uh, because it's very dynamic. And the, the brain works really, really hard to follow the ball flying around and then also matching with the hand that is difficult also without the mask, <laughs> let alone with. Um, and why is it difficult? Because for, for a reason we don't know, time perception and space perception when you wear the mask is different. All students that we ask after the activation session, so how long do you think you've been wearing the mask? All of them, or most, most of them say half of the time of the actual time. So that is definitely related to brainwave, possibly to altered state of consciousness where you really escape the matrix, escape the time uh, space uh, prison, I would call it. Uh, so that's about the ping pong. And we also have a girl uh, roller skating, uh, then uh, we also have uh, myself riding a bike, another boy riding a bike, very, very difficult because it's dynamic. It's a lot of information to, to process. So that is really high level indeed of InfoVision. Um, the autistic boy, the parents came to us for the blindness, not for the autism. Actually, they didn't even mention that the boy had autism and good that they didn't mention because at the time we had absolutely not, not no experience, no knowledge about autism. The only thing we knew was a very primitive uh, definition of autism, which is, you know, these children somehow live in another world or their own world or something. That was all that we knew at the time. The very, very primitive explanation of autism. So um, they asked us about blindness. We said, yes, of course, let's try. We'll do our best, no guarantee, but our heart is all there. Let's see what we can do. So they came, and when they came, big surprise. It was mother, father, grandmother, and the other brother. And the boy was completely nonverbal and generally screaming all the time. So there was no way of us communicating with the boy and that was completely unexpected. We thought, okay, the boy will just sit there nicely and the translator will help us and we'll do our stuff and then we'll see what happens. Absolutely nothing of our methodology could be used because no nonverbal and he rejected everything, not even hearing communication. Uh, I tried to befriend with him, like uh, touching gently his, he was wearing shorts. Oh, again, tons of screaming. So absolutely no traditional way of building a bridge between me and him. So uh, I understood that none of the, our, our traditional ways would work. So then my improvision kicked in and said, okay, everybody out of the room. Let me stay alone with the boy. And what I did, I asked myself, how can I connect with this boy? And the answer that came was for me the most unexpected answer. Then reading books on autism, I found that answer years later. The answer that I got was silence. 
that is the bridge you can use between him and you, silence. So I just sat back and did nothing. Even my breathing, I controlled it, that it's really, because I know blind children are very sensitive with their hearing. And the boy continued to cry, to cry, to cry, but at some point he realized he has no audience anymore. And then he started to slow down with his crying, and then he started to pay attention with his hearing to the environment. And then I could use the improvision uh, activation methodology for blind children, but again, absolutely no sound, no touch, none of the usual ways. And with that, we spend about, Mark says, 40 minutes, I don't know, because I never watch the time when I do that. And again, the perception of time is different when I work in provision. And, but I noticed from the body language that he responded to my activation. So then I just kept changing colors to have the contrast information, to keep him pay attention, not bored, uh, and changing things, keep him uh, engaged. Finally, people lost their patience in the other room and they cracked the, the door open to see what I'm doing. And then, they, of course, the boy heard them and then the, the session was over, of course. Um, after two days from that session, uh, the boy came again with the father and I told him, uh, the boy again, it was, uh, the, he was the, the real autistic. Uh, I differentiate between several types of autism, not all are real autistic in my, again, understanding. But this one was authentic, genuine autistic. What I mean by that is, was that he was a prodigy. By the age of three, he had taught himself to play classical music and not any classical music by the age of three, being blind. So he was indeed living, as we primitively understood autism at the time, he was really living in a world of music. That's all that was interesting to him, music and nothing else. And the finger of some person guiding him from here to there. Um, so two days after, the father came and I told him we'd do the same. Uh, we sat in the room, making no sound whatsoever. I cleared the room, it was a large room. I put all the tables around, uh, along the walls and left the middle of the room completely empty and put him in the middle of the room and we stood back, absolutely no sound whatsoever. Same process, the boy started screaming, but interesting, not calling mama, not calling father, nothing, just screaming. Again, at some point he realized there's no audience, so he had to do something. And that was second time when, I, what I call, he landed into our world. When he got curious about our world, he started to blindly walk in the room and he bumped into a table and he started to take, do the shape of the table with his hands and feel the table and then the chair and then he bumped into the window. So I understood that these parents did exactly the opposite of those parents that Mark mentioned about that other girl. The parents gave him no possibility, because he was born blind, gave him no possibility to learn this world, to integrate himself into this world, being blind. It's not the end of the world if you are blind. You can still function in this world. Um, so we did that. And three days after that, we received that video, which you saw, in which the first part was uh, me trying to connect with the boy and the second part is him at home not only playing correctly that uh, game which requires vision 
And uh, uh, if you notice, the first key he got it wrong, he, he pressed the, the neighbor key. But then all the rest of the keys he pressed correctly. But also if you look at his face, he's a completely new child, so happy, smiling to his ears. And when he finishes the exercise and the mother says, amazing, in, yeah, in, um, in uh, Slovakian, uh, the boy says the same word. So was he really nonverbal until then, or he really did not want any connection with this world? He learned the vocabulary, but he just did not want any connection with this world for whatever soul divine reason, it's another thing. Um, but yes, that was one of the most amazing experiences that we had with information. Um, maybe Mark, and I think I heard Mark talk about this. Can this be done in the dark? Have you done any experiments with this being done in the dark? Microphone, Mike. Yeah, yeah, Microphone. Bravo, I applause your question. Uh, when the people before ask, is it if we can see being blindfolded without using eyes, can we see in the darkness? And I said, of course not. How can you see in the darkness? Because what does it mean visual images? It's uh, photons, reaction of photons, and our rating react on this. And uh, it's the uh, visual, uh, visual diapason is between infrared and so uh, you cannot see in uh, infrared or oh, violet and infrared here yes, because it's uh, there is no visual images. Our uh, retina cannot react on it. No visual images point. But Miss Michaela, it's a very nice, smart co-author said Mark. You say that uh, we start to see approximately three months after born because we accept visual images. And approximately three months, some uh, visual images come to our brain. Brain uh, goes to this uh, distributor of visual images. Uh, say that, Did I have it? Before? Yes, I have this image. It's face of my mother. And he smiled. So we can see, just, can see just because we have visual images in distributor or something. In another distributor, we have hearing images, smell. We can recognize all the signals. In infrared, she said, we don't have any one visual image in infrared. But why we cannot create these visual images? Geniusity, yes, it's a great idea. Okay, let's try. Uh, we were standing in hotel, it's, it was quite a big uh, bathroom and completely darkness. We go there, I take with me uh, orange, banana and uh, torch with infrared possibility. So uh, we come close the door, no lights, darkness. I turn on this infrared uh, torch. You know, from the short distance, 15, 20 centimeters, I could see red point. But if I take far, zero. Michaela was is in blindfold mask, so it was no eyes. And she could see, she could see this infrared signal from the all long of this bathroom, about maybe two, two and a half uh, meters. So, okay, she can see it. I took the orange and make the, this infrared rays on the orange and said, Michaela, that is orange, that is banana, that is orange, that is banana, orange, banana, orange, banana. I create visual images in infrared diapason. Then I st start to ask you, what is this orange? What is this banana? What is this again banana? What is this banana? What is this orange? And I'm a bad person. Before I show banana in this way, without any extra words, I take banana in opposite way. What is this 
and she said, and she said that is banana, but before it was like smile. <laughs> Up we use opposite. So I understand that it's possible, we understand that it's possible to see in the darkness. And for the beginning, we thought, oh, it's a good idea to create uh, seminars in darkness uh, to teach uh, people to see in the darkness. But then we thought, why do we need it? Do really, do we need this ability? No, in darkness at night time, we're supposed to have a rest. We're supposed to have a rest to our brain, to our body. Okay, it's special uh, army. Maybe they need it. Okay, let they train the soldiers to see being blind uh, to see in the darkness but, but they have the technology anyway they don't need information they have the technology that the special forces have the technology very advanced so they don't need our seminar but did, didn't the indonesian uh, military use the uh, this technique yes yeah i believe so yes yeah I think which, which which technique, technique that i described but uh, Mikhail is good, and I agree. They have special equipment for this one. And the uh, uh, normal, average people, we don't need uh, yeah, yeah. possibility to see in the darkness. Maybe it uh, will be bother us when we are going to sleep. Well, one interview you were doing, Mark, I saw you talk about, and I noticed this when, when, the, when the kids, like a lot of times when they're, um, say, shooting a gun or something at a, at a colored target, they look sideways and they're shooting like this. And you have this thing, like it's almost like they're using the side of their head. At one interview, I think you said that you didn't know how, but you were going to try to figure it out. Have you come to any conclusion why the head is sort of tilted when they're looking at something? You know, I'm starting, I'm starting, I'm starting to this question, answer this question, but I believe Michaela gave more information. People ask me why your student turned uh, head. And my answer was because they don't need, uh, they don't use eyes. If they uh, use eyes, this, they're supposed to um, keep the subject in front of eyes to see it using the eyes. If they don't use eyes, brain create this visual window somewhere here for somebody, somewhere for somebody here. It does not depend from the eyes. So for me, it's absolutely normal when my student turn uh, head to the left or to the right. That is my answer. I believe Mikhail uh, gave it more details maybe. Um, on a physiological level, the explanation may be that uh, whichever the channel is, which is not physical for sure, but once the information gets into the physiology, let's say the brain, then uh, the part of the brain that receives the visual, the infovision visual uh, information is uh, the thalamus. And thalamus, very interesting, it also has two hemispheres. So that was for me, at least part of the explanation why we turn our head in one direction or another because the, the information gets processed by that particular hemisphere of the um, thalamus and then gets uh, to the um, uh, visual cortex that is part of the explanation however With the experiments that we've done, we notice that the paper can be, for example, on the left side and the student doesn't know it, but they see it on the right side. So that is very interesting that going back a little bit to a question that you asked before, the information from the point of view of perception is non-local. It absolutely doesn't matter where that paper is. It looks to you, it's here. It's processed here, not it is here. And then when you understand that, then the paper can be under the table, in another room, in a briefcase, at your back, wherever you want. 
that is one thing. Uh, on the other thing, on the other hand, I have no explanation yet why even on the left side the image can be projected. It's literally a projection of the image. Uh, maybe here, or maybe here, or maybe here. Uh, and it takes time until you get all these individual windows, as we call them, to enlarge them and eventually get them to merge into a large one. Um, but why individual? Is there any significance to it? Like, does this window correspond to something in particular, maybe to some organ or maybe to some uh, pattern of thinking? I don't know, but it must have uh, a meaning to that. It must be not accidental that it, it pops up here or there. But when we learn to see at the back, the image still gets projected somewhere in the normal visual range, visual field. Why? Because again, the mind has the conditioning that if I want to see, it must be somewhere here. Uh, and we have many, not many, but we have quite a few videos of children and adults seeing at the back with the mask or without the mask even. Very interesting. Uh, and so uh, now I'm doing exercises with children in particular that I get them to focus straight forward. In the beginning, you see something on the left or on the right, but in the middle, there's like, um, you know, like a, a passage of darkness. You cannot see anything like this distance, this, this width. Uh, and for me, this is the portal to the subconscious mind. This is what I use with adults to get into subconscious mind. So what I'm doing now with children and uh, experimenting what can be achieved, and I don't have enough uh, statistics, is once they see on the left and on the right, I'm doing both so that the brain is balanced, you use both of the, the hemispheres. Then I tell them, you know, just look straight and see there the paper, rather than turning your head, stay like this until this darkness gives you the, the color of that paper. And that would definitely be another part of the brain, possibly, um, passing by also the thalamus getting probably into the core part of this midbrain. This is just hypothetical and theoretical, but it makes sense to me. Uh, and again, wherever you see, even when you dream, it's still in front of you that the image gets projected. Uh, you mentioned the, the importance of the parents in uh, how a child turns out. I heard a story once about a skeptical father brings the child to the training at one point, and he gets inside the field. He gets within a couple of feet to see what the kid is doing, and suddenly the kid loses their sight. Is, is, is there a, a truth to that sort of story? That, yes. that Okay, so explain what your, what your experience is with this. Um, we had quite a few of uh, experiences with either the father or the mother uh, being the skeptical parent uh, or actually little harmony between the parents and using this as an excuse for further conflict between the parents. That also has happened. But whichever the case, uh, of course the child is tuned in to the parents' field. And as I said, uh, when they are with you, the trainer, uh, if you have a nice energy, then they tune in to you and things start to work. When they tune back into the parents, either that the parent gets in the room or 
the child goes home, uh, then your half an hour, one hour cannot overwrite the seven, eight, whatever number of years uh, of tuning, attunement of the child to the, the family. And it's actually correct, uh, holistically speaking, that it is so. Otherwise, anybody uh, could come into your child's field and do whatever they want with it. So it's correct that the child belongs to the family field. The problem is when that information field of the family is not supporting the health or the normal development of the child. Um, and I've had um, cases where, for example, a 17-year-old uh, teenager, uh, the, the mother and the father were with us in the room, which is something generally we do not accept for this particular reason, because then they are into the emotional pattern that they are familiar with at home. Oh, if I don't see the color, my mother will scold me at home or my father will criticize me or whatever. So generally we invite the parents in only when the child is stable and then we don't risk that the child loses it. But this uh, in this case, the parents were there. And the, the, the young man, not a boy, the young man just could not see. And we spent half an hour, 40 minutes, and he just could not see anything. And that was really unusual at that age. Uh, for an adult, I accept that we need longer. But at that age, it was not normal that uh, he, he could not start to, to see. So then I wondered, what, what's happening here that uh, not, the boy cannot get it? And then I got it. One of the parents is against this. It's uh, his, he or she is skeptical. So then I looked at the parents, screened them. Okay, it's the father. So as I was thinking now, okay, I cannot invite just him out. It wouldn't be polite. Uh, okay, so I was thinking, how can I invite both of them out, of course. And by the time I figured some polite invitation, the mother got it. And she invited him out, the husband. You know, I just go downstairs and wait for us in the car. It may take some time and I know you're not patient, but no. she was very nice and gentle. The minute he stepped out of the room and closed the door, the boy, the teenager, saw the color that he was looking at. Uh, so that was so, so, so clear for me that, yes, definitely the parents, and again, it's normal, and when it's beneficial, it's good, but when it's not beneficial, then, that's why I said, we are now involving the parents when we feel something not working, we are involving the parents into the provision information field, not as students necessarily, but for them to, to, to get tuned in and we uh, sometimes need to teach them to be happy for the child instead of, oh, you, you got one wrong out of ten, to say, no, he got nine correct out of ten. You know, this shift of half full, half open, uh, uh, empty approach. Uh, so yes, definitely. Uh, the, the parents influence the child and that's what makes it difficult again with blind and deaf children because they are with you one hour but then they go back home where they are allowed to touch they're allowed to hear and they don't use they don't stimulate this seed of vision that we are planting in our classes. So ideally, uh, we either, you know, take two years to get solid results, uh, or we create an environment where the parents are very little present, say some kind of retreat that uh, children would be in one house, 
and parents in another so that they don't get scared or oh, you are take kidnapping my child or anything um, and uh, in, in all this time we would interact with the parents we would show them footage of what we are doing with the children and we would educate the parents how for them to step out into uh, from the mode of i'm the parent of a blind child uh, i want to add a little bit energy if you have strong energy that that is impossible it block and you can do nothing if you have energy that yes i know it's possible it supports it make it easier so it's very important what kind of energy will be present that yes, is yes. very very good point that, that you mentioned that because that supports uh, another experience that i had uh, you know people are asking for evidence so i said okay let me collect some evidence, uh, uh, medical reports of the children I'm working with in Romania, my country, um, with uh, children with glasses. So let's measure, really, let's monitor the, the progress. So I bought professional eye chart myself so that we compare the same thing. The child gets, you know, adjusted, accustomed to staring at that eye chart and so on and i noticed something very interesting with one uh, teenager in particular again uh, the father was kind of against he really wanted glasses and surgery and finish all the problem yes it's three thousand euros okay i'll earn that money and we do that surgery and then everything is solved the mother wanted information uh so finally the father said okay let's decide what route we are going to take either the doctors or in provision if we go with our daughter to the doctor and i see that she can read the eye chart okay i shut up i follow you but if she cannot then you shut up and she takes glasses back and when she's 18 she does the surgery okay i immediately felt the 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 trouble so i said i want to be with you they are family friends with me so i said i want to be with you the mother stayed at, uh, in the lobby because too many people in one uh, room so it was the girl, the father, the doctor, and me. Private clinic, lots of money. The girl was so emotionally disturbed already by the discussions, probably for weeks, for days, about this testing, that she could see nothing. She was shaking and she could see nothing. And the doctor was so victorious, like, what did you expect? You were here a month ago. What did you expect to happen? Like, and why is she not wearing the glasses? Are you an irresponsible parent? If she's not wearing the glasses, the problem will, be, will, will get worse, and then the surgery will not work. Oh. The father was crazy. We went out. She, she said to the, the wife, you see, I told you, this is all bullshit glasses surgery no more discussion and he went home and i told to my friend the mother you know if you have any little confidence left in me as your friend in me as a person in me as a person doing this method and knowing what i'm talking about I'm offering you one last thing, and then if it doesn't work, I'm out of your life forever. Let's go to another doctor who doesn't know the history of the girl, who knows nothing about us. Just any, you pick the doctor, not me. And she said, okay, let's do it. So she called some other, um, state clinic we went there 
What's the problem? Oh, a little bit of tiredness in the eyes. Uh, okay. The procedure in Romania is that you do the, the job drawn first. And then when you get to the eye chart, you don't read with the eyes anymore. You already get lens uh, that would match your diagnosis based on the dioptron uh, measurement. And we told to the lady uh, doctor, you know, we would have some unusual requests if you allow. We would like that we do the eye chart first and then the dioptron. And she was nice to accept it. It's not the usual procedure. But she said, okay, she looked at us like, okay, what strange people I've got here, but she accepted it. And the girl now relaxed in a totally different energy. The lady was a nice, oldish, very friendly uh, doctor. The mother was not relaxed, but trusting me. I trust it completely because I know what infovision is all about. And guess what? The girl read the entire eye chart. One hour distance between the two checkups. So yes, the energy and the information field that we all live in, if we are not centered and we are not confident in ourselves, then we are at the mercy of the energy and information field that we are in that particular moment. Wow. It's been, it's been a total honor to talk to you too because you have Thank so you. much knowledge of, of, of how this works and the sort of the background as to what might be going on. And that's why I think it's so important is that it, it starts to teach you what is reality, that you, you got this wrong, you got that wrong, you got this wrong. You're starting to understand. Can I ask you as we close, what, have you got any plans for research and things that you'd like to try to uh, go after? And then can you describe your, your process and where people can contact you in terms of uh, if they want to follow through with this? Because you've been doing it for, well, Mark's been doing it for 20 years. So you've got a lot of background on, on how this works. Yeah, okay. So uh, very briefly, um, we, we've got some scientific uh, research um, fr from a different perspective, uh, which I do not necessarily empathize with because I understand the, uh, the, the mind uh, of the scientific world. Um, so Mark's intention was to look for evidence and show that this ability is not only reality, but it's normal. It's not paranormal, it's not extrasensorial, it's normal. Any child you would pick up from the street, you give him the time, he can see blindfolded. Uh, and the same with the adults, just longer time, but that doesn't matter for, for the discussion we're having now. So he tried to uh, look for evidence uh, without him being at all a specialist in how the brain works, in what medical equipment uh, are out there. And so he wasn't really able to guide the scientific research himself. He said, I'm just bringing this to your attention. You are the specialist. You find out, you figure it out. And again, going back to the energy and belief system, which doctors also have, uh, they created the experiment according to their mind structure, according to their beliefs, according to their doubts, and so on. So the uh, actual proof was given very, in a very interesting way uh, not by literally showing that, yes, uh, the brain lights up there when you're doing for vision or there, but by showing that it operates in a way which is not according to the books. So now the doctors would have to explain, for example, why when you do a cognitive activity, 
uh, whether a child or an adult, uh, you are normally in beta. Why is it if you read blindfolded, which is the most difficult uh, exercise in infovision, why is it that you are in alpha? That completely contradicts science. There's no answer to this question scientifically. Um, so we got actually a lot of insight of how the brain works and why we get these benefits from these studies, which not, did not necessarily pinpoint it, yes, this is real. Everybody was afraid to actually acknowledge that. Uh, but they did have to report on these unusual things. Uh, so this is one way uh, which we would like to continue. Now we did our own homework and did some reading about the equipment existing out there. And we would like to investigate on that. Again, hoping that there are scientists open to our offer, because that's the first barrier <laughs> that we have to remove. And the other way would be uh, like this, you know, you have a child or an adult, uh, the dioptron uh, says uh, they have minus eight dioptries, but they read the entire chart. Well, the let again the, the ophthalmologist explain how that is possible. So again, it's an indirect proof, as I call it, that something must be happening if your eyes cannot give you the visual image, but you do see. And the same with deaf, and the same with um, or autism, and with anything, uh, with dementia. That lady, her score was absolutely zero, so she was completely gone. And after two sessions, uh, she had, I put on the bed next to her, uh, three colored cups, red, blue, and yellow, and I told her, pick up the blue, and she did. How is that possible? Well, all of that, uh, we should be doing these things, ideally, with at least an EEG connected all the time, 24-7, and it's non-invasive, so it doesn't interfere with the brain, but 24-7 to really see the raw data of how the brain fluctuates and changes its modus operandi between infovision, non-infovision, between more infovision and more infovision and more infovision. So we have some ideas, but it requires um, open-minded scientists the new generation of scientists, not necessarily young, but new generation of scientists, the ones who are open to the, the consciousness research rather than the actual optical nerve, because things do not happen in the optical nerve. Things happen on a consciousness level. Uh, and possibly, uh, and ideally, I would say, a team of specialists in which one would monitor this, one would monitor that, and then all of this raw data would be put together uh, to, to get a really uh, clear, a clearer picture. For now, for us, uh, we understood enough through the other scientific method, which is empirical observation. We saw this is possible, this is possible, this is happening, this is said for this. For us, this is empirical observation, which is one of the two scientific ways. The other one is, okay, you see this is possible, let's study how it's happening, why it's happening. So. Yeah, beautiful. And, and how, how would people contact you? We're gonna put the link in in the description as to your website, but um, are you where are you operating? Are you in Turkey now or where are you operating? Yeah. Yes, yes. Now we are in uh, Turkey uh, trying to put together a project, a wide scale project for children. Uh, but uh, anyway, we are uh, online, present online, and we are also open to, to traveling with all these restrictions wherever possible. Uh, 
so uh, I would uh, recommend our Facebook pages. Okay. And uh, we would get it from there. Beautiful. Okay, I want to thank you. One, one last question. Um, the Central Intelligence Agency in the mid-1980s was studying uh, Chinese children who were blindfolded. Have you had any interest at all from governments or, because you would figure that the government, especially intelligence agencies would think, this is, this is fantastic, if we could learn this. Have you had any interest from the government or are they like the scientists where they're sort of doing their own thing? I think, yes, exactly. I think they know everything that needs to be known already. Uh, probably studying these Chinese children, but also India is, uh, this ability is widely uh, taught uh, and possibly other parts of the world. But I know specifically about China and India, indeed Malaysia, Asia, generally speaking. Uh, so I think they collected all the information they needed and I think they are using it, uh, but it was very interesting, again, speaking of consciousness and divine uh, plan, uh, it was very interesting for me, uh, a report I read about the Chinese children, uh, in which um, the authors were saying that uh, Chinese are really, really, into this they are really it's a culture for them to collect these people to identify the children to identify these children as young as uh, possible and then really take them away in centers and train them train them extensively and really getting incredibly paranormal however when they turn to this 12 13 threshold Something very interesting happens, 80% this article was saying, 80% of them lose this, all these abilities. And then the question is, why? You know, you trained all that long, you would think you will have it for the rest of your life, right? Like here are us trying to learn it at this age and trying to keep it. And then you have children starting at three years old, how can you lose it when you turn 12? uh my answer this is purely my answer to to this question uh, one of the things and the most important thing you learn it gets activated when you learn a paranormal ability no matter what that is i think uh, you learn to tell the truth from false and you learn to tell the people's, to read people's intentions. And even within provision, many people have come to us, to me and said, you know, I used to have abilities when I was a child, but everybody was laughing at me or they were mocking at me or criticizing me. And then I didn't want to have it <clears throat> anymore. And then it stopped. So if you have a strong emotional or mental reason to not want that ability, then you can literally block it. So my theory is that when they get to 12, 13, these children figure out that all that training was not really for them. So they don't want to be part of that end goal of the training. So they either lie that I cannot do this anymore or they literally shut it down. Second, I want to make your attention from a little bit other side. Uh, it will be more question than answer, but it will be interesting to, hear, to listen it. Just imagine that everybody from the beginning will accept infravision and never uh, have any kind of problem with the eyes. <coughs> what will we do this manufacture of glasses like Gucci, other ones, they go out of business and that is billion. Okay, infravision will help <coughs> with the 
healthy. Do you know how many doctors and uh, pharmaceutical uh, factories go out of business? Can you imagine? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> that is a little bit other angle of looking at the Yeah. I, I really appreciate your time, and I'm sure that when my assistant sees that she may want to have some questions, maybe we can do a, a short second interview. But I'm I'm honored to have talked to you, and thank you for the information, and thank you for doing what thank you're you. doing. I think you're you're changing thank the you. world, and if it were up to me, you'd get a Nobel Prize. This is fascinating stuff and very important. So thank you for your time, and hopefully we can thank do you. it again. And from my side, I want to see you. Thank you very very much for your smart interesting question thank you beautiful and spread uh, thank you for spreading the the information because we need to get to that critical mass in which not necessarily that we all learn improvision but at least we expand we get out, out of our little box and start to pay attention to the larger world that is out there for us to explore Beautiful. I will do whatever I can to promote your message because I think it's extremely important. Thanks.